Hi, this is Natalie. Thank you for listening to Crossroads Church, where we are bringing a real God to real people. I believe you'll be inspired by today's message. Hey, I'm Joel. I'm a teaching guy around here, and I'm honored to serve under Pastors Marcus and Natalie Avalos. They've been here, they've been here 16 years faithfully. And you know, the cool thing has been, I've been here the last five years of it, which is unbelievable to me that I've been here five years. Uh, I don't stick around anywhere for five years. So... Uh, it's been awesome to watch. You know, I think that right now this church is in a season of reaping a lot of the fruit of some hard ground, ground that Pastor Marcus and Natalie have, have been working the ground for a long time. You know, if you plant seeds and stick around long enough, you'll eventually get to hang out in the shade of the seeds you planted. So we're, we're seeing that right now at this church. It's an exciting time to be here, and I would encourage you to get involved. And the small groups are a great place to get involved. And I want to do a promo on something. This is something you learn when you, when you serve on a church staff. You learn to never from the... the uh, platform, uh, promote one small group because everybody else's small group's like, why didn't you promote mine? But I'm going to promote one specific small group because it's near and dear to my heart, okay? So I, all the rest of you small group leaders, don't come up and hate on me later, okay? There's a group back there called Precept Upon Precept, um, and it's a Bible study system that by a lady named Kay Arthur, and I grew up through middle and high school, like most of my Bible education was from that material, Precept Upon Precept. It's the best way, it's, I think it's called inductive method. It's the best way, if you really want to learn more of what's in the Bible, we talked two weeks ago about the importance of knowing and having the Word of God in your heart. I would encourage you, get involved in that precept. Precept. It's not a small group for the faint of heart, like there's work involved, but if you really want to put in the work and get a lot out of your spiritual growth um, from reading the Bible, I would encourage you, check out that small group. So again, don't hate on me, all the rest of you small groups. Lots of great small groups out there, but I, that one is really near and dear to my heart because I much of my childhood was spent learning from that system. So we're going to continue our series this morning called Build It. Actually, this is the last one in the series, and I got to be honest, this is the one I've been most excited about. We talked about the power of the Word of God. We talked about the importance of community. And today we're going to talk about how to hear and gain direction from God. So y'all ready for this? Emily and I had been dating about eight months when I realized I, I wanted to marry her, right? And I, I just knew. So I, I, went and, uh, I went and got a ring, and then I went and talked to her dad, and I said, hey, can I marry your daughter? And he gave the thumbs up, and I was like, yes, this is going to be awesome. Um, I think she's the one. And everybody's like, wait, you think she was the one? I was like, well, I didn't know she was the one until I said I do. But up to that point, I was pretty, pretty sure, right? So uh, what's so funny about that? I'm not a love at first sight guy. It's, anyway, whatever. You felt that. All right. Anyway. So I'm super pumped. I go and tell my, you know, I've been talking to my parents about it. And they're like, oh, we're so excited. We love Emily. Blah, blah, blah. Well, that night after I got permission from Emily's dad, I got a phone call from a mentor of mine that I hadn't heard from in a few months. Her name was Karen. She lived in Mexico. And she called me and she said, hey, Joel, I was just washing the dishes. And I felt like the Lord told me to call you and tell you the timing is wrong on something you're about to do. And I was like, well, 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 I'm about to propose to Emily. Is that it? And she goes, I don't know. I just told, I just got told I'm supposed to call you and tell you the timing's wrong. I was like, well, I need more information here. Like, what else did God tell you? She's like, I don't, that's all he told me. The timing's wrong on something you're about to do. I'm like, you can't just call me and like throw a grenade in my plans. Like, what else did he tell you? She's like, I don't know. You need to seek the Lord and see what he's saying the timing's wrong on. I'm like, no, oh, surely it's not marriage. Like, marriage is a good thing. Emily's great. So I was like, all right, well, whatever. The next morning, another mentor of mine, a guy named Roy, calls me. Roy passed away last year. He was a longtime mentor of mine. He called me. He's like, Joel, I was driving to work this morning. felt like the Lord told me to call you and say, the timing is very wrong on something you're about to do. <laughs> I'm like, what is going on here? Like, and second, why didn't he go talk to me first? Like, come on, Lord, I'm right here. I can hear you, right? So, I talked to my dad. I was like, Dad, do you think the timing's wrong? He's like, I don't know, but two people have told you it is. Maybe you need to check on the Lord, on what the Lord has to say about that. I'm like, I don't want, just, what do I need to do here? Like, I didn't really want to seek the Lord. I just, I thought I had sought the Lord, and I, this is what it led to. So we waited a year, and you know, during that year, a bunch of stuff went down that I realize now, if we'd have gotten married before, it would have caused a major strain in the first year of our marriage. So I am so thankful that I listened to those voices I just did not really want to listen to, but God was watching out for me. And here's what I know about everybody in this room. Every one of us, we come at some point in our life 
to a crossroads. We have to make a decision, right? And I'm not just talking about crossroads of the church. I'm talking about a decision in your life. And there are these moments, you know, for, for the most part, your life is, you are where you are today because of the decisions you've made, for better or for worse. Now, listen, there are some things, circumstances you can't control, things you can't change. But for the most part, the way you chose to respond to the situations around you is what, is what got you here where you are today. And there come not, comes a time when you, you get to like a fork in the road. You ever heard Yogi Berra? He said, when you come to a fork in the road, take it. <laughs> Anyways, the joke. But a lot of times we come to a point where we're like, man, I just, like, if I go this way, it'll do this. If I go that way, it'll do this. And you go, man, this is stressful. Like, you come to a point in your life where you go, man, if I take this career path and have to move across the country for this, that's going to change everything here. We're going to be away from the family. The kids may not go around with their, their grandparents. Uh, man, if I marry this person over here, it's going to make, make this difference. And we all come to these crossroads in our life, and we make these decisions. And I know this about all of us when we come to a crossroads in our life. We usually tend to go one of two ways, and I've gone both of these ways, so I know this, okay? We either, some of us, we're, we're kind of like this. Nobody is going to tell me what to do. This is, this I, I noticed I was a lot more this way when I was young, right? And sometimes, some of us, like, we know that what we're doing probably isn't the best thing. Maybe your mom's been like, mijo, I don't think hanging around with those people is the best thing for you. But you're like, I don't care. I'm 18. Nobody's going to tell me what to do. And some of you, like, your dad's been saying stuff to you, but you got mad at your dad about something he did years ago, and so you're just, like, trying to prove to your dad you can stand up on your own two feet, so you're intentionally doing the opposite of what he's telling you to do, and you're like, nobody's going to tell me what to do. And some of you, man, like, you, you know now, like, your mom was right when she said, mija, I don't think that guy's the best for you to be dating. And now that the divorce is finalized, you're like, man, mom was right. We all get to this point where we go, like, some, there's just something that says, nobody's going to tell me what to do. But here's what I've found is the longer you live and the more you beat your head against the wall, at some point we get to the place where we go, someone, please just tell me what to do. Like, you've, you've made enough bad decisions and live with the results of them where you're just like, I just don't want the weight of this decision sitting on me. I don't know how to deal with this. So somebody just tell me what to do. And this is where we go and we buy, we buy books and people that are like, hey, here's what to do. If you want the best life now, read this book. If you do this, you'll get this. If you do that, you'll get that. We go to the preacher. and Like, preacher, just tell me what to do. I can't tell you how many people, they come to me for counseling, and they're like, just tell me what to do. I'm like, that's not what a good counselor does. There comes a point where you have to stand on your own two feet and figure out what God is telling you what to do, because never forget this. The path that God has for you is the path you want for your life. But we've got to get really good at listening to the voice of the Holy Spirit. So, Jesus, right before he left the earth, he said this. He said, guys, there's a lot more I want to say to you. More than you can handle now. Basically, he says, you can't handle the truth. I'm the fullness of truth. I mean, Jesus was the fullness of truth in human form, and we're still trying to figure out what to do with what he said. And he said, you can't handle all the truth that I've got for you. But when he, the spirit of truth comes, he, that's the Holy Spirit, will guide you into all the truth. And he will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears and he will tell you what is yet to come. Now, this is good news. But this is what, what's challenging for us about this is, is the, Jesus is saying, look, you can't handle all the truth. So if, you, if I gave you the whole truth right now, it would crush you. The truth is that heavy. You know, the truth is pretty, you know, they say the truth will set you free, but it tends to make you miserable in the process. I think of discovering truth as kind of like cutting and open an onion. The other day I cut up an onion that was really fresh, and my daughter Elise was across the room, and she's like, Dad, my eyes are so dry. I'm like, I know, sweetheart, I'm almost through the onion. Hang on. The truth is like that onion, like you cut through a layer, and it burns your eyes, and then you get a little accustomed to it, and you're like, okay, whew, we're good with this onion. Then you cut a little bit more, and it burns your eyes a little bit more. The truth is this huge, powerful concept. And I believe we're all looking for truth for how to live our lives. But what we usually end up doing is we end up looking for some sort of a formula. I spent my 20s looking for a formula. I probably read a thousand books in my 20s. Like, how do I be successful? And I read all these books about people saying, this is what you, if you just do this, you'll be successful. And I'm like, why am I still not successful? I did all that. Why did this work? Well, yeah, it's like, well, you didn't do it right. Okay. 
We're all looking for a formula, but here's what I've found the longer I live. There is no formula for life. There is only revelation of truth through the Holy Spirit. But we like formulas. We just want to, just tell me what I need to do to get the results. I need the A plus B equals C. That's what religion is. Religion is, if you do this and don't do this, you'll be cool with God, you'll get into heaven, right? Now listen, we needed religion before Jesus came along because we needed a framework for how to live our lives in harmony with this world that he created. But when Jesus came along, he said, look, now I'm fulfilling all of those things that were in the rules I put for you that you couldn't fulfill on your own. I paid your debt to God that you could not pay because here's the thing about debt, guys. Debt never just gets erased. It has to be transferred. And I'm talking spiritually here, right? So when there's a debt, somebody has to carry it. And Jesus said, I'll carry the debt. God sent his only son to carry the debt that you owed because you couldn't live up to the standards that he gave. And Jesus is like, I'll shoulder it. But now I need you to look for me for guidance on how to live. And sometimes I may ask you to do stuff that you say, well, that doesn't fit with the formula. Like people are telling me if I do it this way, I'll get it. And he'll say, I need you to do it the complete opposite way. Sometimes they'll say that. Oftentimes, you take the wisdom of what, what has worked in the past, but sometimes they'll ask you to do something. You're like, well, that doesn't, that's kind of counterintuitive. That doesn't make sense. But the, 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 the task of the Christian life is learning to hear from the Holy Spirit on your own yes. and not counting on religion or do this, don't do that. Jesus came and he fulfilled the demands of religion. And now he says, now look to me and I'm sending my Holy Spirit. I'm taking off. But right next to you at any given point that you need guidance on that crossroads, the Holy Spirit is going to be right there whispering in your ear what you need to hear. There is no formula for life. And if you're looking for a formula, you're going to be frustrated because what works for one person won't work for you. So there's this verse in in Isaiah, and I love it. It says this. It says, Who among you fears the Lord and obeys his servant? If you are walking in darkness without a ray of light, Trust in the Lord and rely on your God. Some of you may feel like that this morning. You're like, man, I just, I don't know what to do next. Like, I've, I've made a mess of my life. I've made some really bad choices, and here I am. I'm starting all over from scratch. Hey, you're in a really good place, because you know what? You don't really need faith when it's sunshine and unicorns prancing through the sky. You only need faith when it gets really, really dark, and you don't know what the next step is. And you say, yeah, but I made this darkness around me. Hey, that's all right. Trust in the Lord in the middle of it because he knows the way to get you out right where you need to go. And he hasn't forgotten about you. And he says this, but watch out you who live in your own light and warm yourselves by your own fires. This is the reward you will receive from me. You will soon fall down in great torment. How's that for a Hallmark card? (laughs) Give that to your son, right? He's saying, look, If you seek the Lord, he will guide you. But for those of you who are trying to have your own light, it's not going to go well for you. The only way you're going to get out of this situation is if you seek the Lord. So I started thinking, what are some of the ways that we live by our own light? And and I came up with three of them that we're going to talk about this morning. The first one is by being led by our emotions. Now listen, God created your emotions. They're a beautiful thing. But they're not meant to, to lead you. Truth is meant to lead you. Remember, you're going to be led in all truth. And the challenge with emotions is we are all driven by them. In fact, they've, they've shown, studies have shown that we are actually very emotional beings who make rational decisions to back up what we're already feeling emotionally. You go, well, not me. I'm a facts guy. Sorry, I'm a facts guy too, but I'm driven more by emotions than I want to acknowledge. Every one of us at our core, we're driven by our emotions because they're very powerful. And they're part of who we are. And, and what's challenging is we, we come up with the facts to back up what we already feel in our gut. We saw this recently with COVID, okay? So COVID, dangerous illness for a lot of people. A lot of people very rightly terrified out of their mind of COVID. So they, they started latching on to any information that proved that they had a reason to be terrified, right? Latch, oh, 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 look at the stats. Look at how many people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because they already felt fear over it, right? Then there's other people who their greater fear was of the government encroaching upon them. And they're like, well, COVID's not as big of a deal as we say it is now. It was a very big deal for some people. But in their mind, they're like, well, my greater fear is the government. I'm that way. I'm more, way more afraid of the government than some illness, right? 
So we start looking up reasons to back up why COVID's not that big of a deal and all these rules we're making are ridiculous, right? So we always find rational facts to back up what we're already feeling emotionally. And this gets really dangerous. I'll never forget in high school, I had a teacher, I was talking to him, I was like, well, the Bible says this, and he said this to me. He said, I know the Bible says that, but I feel like that's not God's heart. I thought that was fascinating. And you know, here's the thing. I had this epiphany during first service. People were like, what happened to you? I was like, I had an epiphany during first service. That poor guy, I say poor guy, he's in prison for the rest of his life for pedophilia. Now, this is, what's, this is where things go really quickly. I guarantee you he felt genuinely in his heart that he was in love with that kid. But your feelings will lie to you. And they are horrible leaders. And, and, and the danger is this. So here's, here's, there, here's uh, I'm going to talk about something really fast. And you guys are going to go, wait, I need to hear more about that. I'm going to blow through this. Chapter five of this book goes in depth on this circle I'm going to talk to you about. So if you're like, what is he talking about? They're back there, you can get this book. And, but I'm going to blow through this right now because this is the essence of what you're made up of. You're made up of your body. This is what you can see, touch, taste, feel. A little bit deeper is your soul, which is your emotions your will, that's your desires, and your mind. And then the deepest part of you is your spirit. Now, the spirit, it says, is dead before Christ comes and makes you alive. I don't understand how it all works, but it says you were dead in your sins, in your spirit. But when Jesus came, it says his spirit came and lived in you, the same spirit that raised Christ Jesus from the dead came and lived in you, and he brings life to your body. So now we're living from here. What's caught in the middle is our flesh, our body's desires, the things we want, versus what the spirit of God wants. And you know what's caught in the middle is your emotions your mind, your thoughts, and your desires. And there's a constant battle going on. And most of us, what happens, we live from the outside in. So we're feeling good. We go to the Elevation Worship Concert, and we're like, yay, Jesus is so awesome. And then your ex calls on the drive home. And God has fallen off the throne. Right? Oh, God, why are you doing this to me? And just a minute ago, you're like, Jesus, you're so good to me. Sunday morning, you come like, oh, I feel so pumped up. The worship was amazing. And then on the drive home, your kid, you're just like. Drink. <laughs> and you're like, what is wrong? Why did God curse me with these children? <laughs> and just five minutes earlier, God had blessed you. Because your emotions, they start messing with you, right? And the challenge is this, like, there's this verse that says in, in Hebrews, Paul says this, the word of God is living and active. It's sharper than a two-edged sword. It's like really sharp. And it says it's piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, and it's discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Sometimes we can actually feel like something's in our spirit that's not truth because our emotions have been deceived. And we can fall for believing something's true when it's not true. And the Bible is the only thing that dividing line between that's true or that's not true. And it's very hard to distinguish sometimes because your emotions can feel so real. It can feel so real. I'll give you an example for me. Mondays are my emotional days. Don't call Joelle on a Monday. Mondays, man, I get like, I don't know if it's an attack from the enemy or exhaustion or a combination of both, but every Monday I'm like, what am I doing? I am a horrible speaker. I have no business being up there speaking. I'm going to go start a taco truck. Like, I'm not kidding. This happens every Monday. And my wife's like, Joelle, it's Monday. Get over. Go take a nap. I'm like, but it's so real. I'm horrible at this. I suck at what I do. And she's like, no, you're good at it. And you know what? Everybody in here could tell me afterwards, Joelle, you did a great job. My wife could even tell me you did a great job. But in my mind, my emotions, because I'm tired. And, and listen, your tired level affects your emotions and you can be led sometimes. You're like, oh, I'm just, I just feel like God fell off the throne. He didn't fall off the throne. The truth of the word says he didn't fall off the throne. He's still very much in charge. You just are tired. <laughs> and you think it's your spirit speaking to you, but it's not. It's just right here getting caught up in the tiredness of your body. It's siding with your body over here. And there's also patterns to this. This is really important to understand too. Here's another thing I've learned about myself. There are certain times of the year that I'm an emotional mess. August is one of them. Yeah, right now, this horrible, wretched month. Here's why August is horrible for me. For one, it's hot as the fifth level of hell. <laughs> and heat, I'm telling you, man, there's studies, scientific studies that have shown that violence, in fact, the number one time for check-ins at behavioral hospitals is in August. 
You know why? It's heat. They've shown that violence increases up to about 88 degrees proportionally with the heat, with the temperature increase. Scientifically, they've shown this. And some of you, you've been like, why have I been so angry lately? Because it's been hotter than the level of hell. That's why you've been so angry lately. And you've got to bring it down a lot. And you've got to recognize, man, all that stuff you're feeling, it's just because it's hot right now and you're tired. And, and August is a hard month for me. Another reason August is hard for me is because I'm like bleeding money. It, it's like, hey, Elise needs new clothes for school. Hey, here's the bill from the school for registration. Oh, and by the way, you need to pay this parent involvement fee. I'm like, what the flip is a parent involvement fee? I don't even want to be involved. Why do I got to pay it? So I'm like bleeding money. On top of it, this year has been absolutely horrible because I've just been building this retreat center. It's like every last dime is going to that. And they're like, everything's $1,000. You need that? It's $1,000, $1,000. I'm like, I'm just excited. And so August is a really bad month for me. In fact, a couple weeks ago, I like got a little frustrated with someone. And afterwards, Emily's like, you know, it's August. And I'm like, oh, that's why I've been such a freaking hellion. Like, I've been horrible. It's August. And I have to remind myself, it's August. Everything I'm feeling about life isn't necessarily true. Another bad month for me is February because I hate the cold. I hate the heat. I hate the cold. Every February, I'm like, oh, I just had to quit. I want to give up on life. And it was like, it's February. It's, it's... My wife is very emotionally stable. But anyway, I'm a hot mess. So, but it's important to recognize the patterns of your emotions because there will be times a year that every time, every time this comes around, if you've had a traumatic event happen, that month may be really hard for you in terms of depression. And everything will tell you it's the end of the world. It's never going to get better. But it's not true. Because your emotions, they're, they'll lie to you. And they can feel like it's the Spirit of God within you, but it's the Word of God that will divide. Nope, 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 nope. Your emotions are siding with the tiredness of your body. Your emotions are siding with what's externally happening. You need to get yourself in line with what the Word of God says. And then your mind, you might need to get your mind. So it says, do not be conformed anymore to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so you can test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. Some of you, your mind, you've just got some bad mindsets about who God is, and you just need to get that fixed. And the only way to do that, Word of God. And the Holy Spirit revealing the Word of God to you as you realize, wow, I had a really bad mindset about that. Your emotions, they're a horrible leader. But you've got to be very in tune with your soul. And this is where the word, the Greek word suke is where we get our word psychology. This word here that Paul uses is suke, piercing between the suke and the spirit, right? And suke is our word for psychology, or it's for soul, right? So you're saying, well, I don't need psychology. I just need the word of God. Eh, yeah, but psychology can help a little bit because the Bible talks about understanding the drives of your soul. But getting them in line with the spirit of God that is within you. And the only way you can do that is the Holy Spirit guiding you in truth. Your, horror, your emotions, they're wonderful things, but don't let them lead you. Second thing that we do is we're often, we, we walk by our own light by trying to be exactly like someone else. When I first started doing this public speaking thing, preaching, there were some mentors I had, and I wanted to be exactly like them. And every time I'd do it, it came out clunky. You know what I mean? I'd be like, oh, you know, I'm just not as, I'm not as eloquent as that guy over here. Or I can't be as poetic as this guy over here, but I'd try and I try and copy them. And I went to a church a few weeks ago, and it was funny. There's this preacher there, and he talks like this, breaks up his sentences a lot, says the word saints a lot. And I noticed everybody on staff, all of them talked like that. Good morning, church. Welcome, saints. It's so good. And I'm like, you posers? Like, be yourself. Now, listen, it's good to replicate people you admire, but you will never be that other person. A lot of times we compare ourselves to who the other person is and we, get, we do it poorly because you're not made to be someone else. In fact, Ephesians 2, uh, 2, uh, 10 says this, we are God's handiwork. The Greek says we are God's poema. We're like his masterpiece. Created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. He made you a very specific way. Even those things about you that you don't like, he made those for a reason. In fact, there's a verse that says, who are you to say to your creator, why did you make me this way? There are certain things about you you can't change. And listen, if you can't change it, you need to lean into who God made you to be. I hate how short I am. God made you that way for a reason. I hate how tall I am. God made you that way for a reason. Why can't I eat the way those other people eat? I don't know. But it just is what it is and deal with it. 
And, you, and God made you for that way for a reason. And everything, this is what my next book is about. We, we talked about this a few, I guess about a year and a half ago, we did that series called The Circle Perspective. The book's coming out in March. It's called The Connecting the Dots is what the publisher decided to call it. But we're talking about the fact that everything that has happened to you in your life has been God's preparation for you to do your greatest work. If you're still alive today, all the bumps, all the bruises, all the mistakes, everything that happened, he's going to transform that if you'll let him to turn it into you being fulfilled in, doing, in, in him doing his greatest work in you. He who began a good work in you will be faithful to bring it to completion. Amen. If you're trying to be like somebody else, though, you're just going to be frustrated, and you're going to do it poorly. My brother, he's just, everything he touches turns to gold. Like, he just, the guy can make money. He'll see something, and he'll figure out how to make money from it. Me, man, everything I touch turns to dirt, right? But... <laughs> I'm looking at it sometimes like, how come I can't just touch stuff? And I, and I remember God saying to me one time, hey, I'm not going to hold you accountable when you stand before me for not being as talented as your brother. I'm just going to hold you accountable for what you've got. So use what you've got. And I lean into that. And the funny thing is I'll talk to my brother and he'll be like, man, I wish I had your abilities and this and that. I'm like, I wish I could make money like you. I'd, I'd trade all my abilities for that money. But I'm just kidding. <laughs> but he's brilliant. I'm totally, I'm just kidding. I would not. I've got the better looks too, but, oh. <laughs> and the humility, I'm just kidding, but there's this fact that like, we all tend to compare ourselves to other people, and sometimes we want to be like those other people, like you, some of you, your moms, you're looking at your friend who's got the seven kids, and she homeschools them all, and she's got a three multi-level marketing businesses on the side, and they're constantly on vacation, and you're like, how come I can't be that way, like we've got diapers all over the floor, and there's just, it's like, Stop comparing. Lean into who God made you to be because you'll just be frustrated. And, and if you're trying to, to use somebody else as an example, there's some value in that, but you've got to figure out your unique path and you've got to hear from the Lord. What are you called to do? And then you walk that path. And then that's, that leads to our final one, which is this. A lot of times we walk in our own light by not seeking counsel. We lean on this thing over here where we go, ain't nobody going to tell me what to do. But then we go making a bunch of decisions that don't go well. And we're like, God, why did you do this to me? And he's like, I didn't do anything. You didn't even ask. You just did your own thing. Now I'm going to help you clean up the mess. But God puts people in our lives for us to seek counsel from. And people are an important group to seek counsel from. My father is my greatest counselor. Man, I was thinking the other day, I was like, man, if I'm lucky, I've got 20 years left with my dad. I call him for everything, man. I, anything I do, I check with him. And I thought the other day, I'm like, man, what's going to happen when he's not around? And this sadness came over me. And I felt like God said, hey, I'll still be around. I got you. And I'm like, dang. But, you know, it's so easy to start leaning on people around us. And listen, there is tremendous value in having people around you. But ultimately, there comes a point where it's got to be you seeking the Lord on your own for the Holy Spirit to guide you because you can hear his voice. It says, my sheep hear my voice and they recognize it. Like, you know when the Holy Spirit is speaking to you. My friend Jeff, he's actually in, in the house today. Uh, he said, me, said something to me a few years ago that kind of jolted me. And he said this. He said, if you're not doing wrong, you're doing right. And I was like, whoa, that's really dangerous theology. But it reminded me of something St. Augustine said. St. Augustine said, love God and do as you please, for the heart trained in love to God will do nothing to offend the beloved. I thought, that's, that's scary, because most of the time, I think I'm doing wrong. I've been conditioned to think I'm doing wrong. But if the Spirit of God really is living in you, we have promise that He is guiding us and directing us. So like Jeff says, if you're not doing wrong, you're probably doing right. You're like, well, how, how do I know if I'm doing right? Well, listen, you'll know if you're doing wrong. You know when you're doing wrong. When the Spirit of God lives in you, that conviction comes over. He's like, nya, 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 nya. And you do it anyways and then pay the price. But God's spirit is actually living in you and leading you even when you don't realize he's guiding you. Now, you still seek the voice of the Lord, but you've got to be confident that even if I'm not hearing anything, I know he's guiding and directing me. There's this verse in Isaiah. It says this. It says, and your ears will hear a word behind you saying, this is the way, walk in it when you turn to the right or when you turn to the left. What I think this verse is saying, there's a lot of context to it, but what I think it's saying is, if you're doing your best to serve God and you're walking on the path that you thought you were supposed to be on, but you're not hearing anything from God, you're probably on the right path. He'll tell you if you get off to the right or to the left, but if you're not hearing from God, do the last thing he told you and stick with that until it's done. 
When I was in my junior year of college, I was done with school. I was toast. I was sick of school. I was sick of paying the, paying the bills. I was just tired of it all. And I'll never forget a Navy recruiter flagged me down. He's like, hey, are you sick of school? And I'm like, I am sick of school. <laughs> He's like, I got a deal for you. We'll pay for the rest of your school. And then you just got to join the Navy for five years. And I was like, that's awesome. And I called my dad. I was like, dad, my dad was in the Navy. I was like, dad, the Navy, they're going to bail me out. And he's like, oh, do you feel like you're supposed to join the Navy? I'm like, I don't know what I'm supposed to do. God's not speaking to me. And he's like, well, what was the last thing he told you to do? And I was like, well, I, I was pretty sure he told me to go to college. He's like, did you finish that? I was like, no, I got a year left. He's like, maybe you should do the last thing he told you and then get direction from him. I was like, duh. And I did. And honestly, thank God, like I would have been horrible in the Navy. I would have probably gotten kicked out. But, or they would have just beat the pulp out of me because, <laughs> but it was, it was one of those things where a lot of times we, we like think, man, I just need a constant voice from the Lord. But oftentimes you won't hear a constant voice from the Lord. In fact, I think that's a sign of maturity. I think when he begins to trust you so much and the internal controls you've developed within you by being led by the Spirit, you're not going to get a turn-by-turn -turn instructions from the Lord. You'll just get a turn if he's like, hey, I need you to get back on the track a little bit over here. But he'll be guiding you and directing you. And you have the cap capacity to hear his voice. Some of you this morning are like, man, I, I just... First of all, some of you, you know you're off the path. Like, it says, the Bible says the way of the transgressor is hard. Like it's, when you get off the path, you start getting the thorns and stuff, and you're like, why is life so hard? Well, you got off the path, buddy. So get back on the path. Do your best to get back on the path. And some of you, though, this morning, you're just like, I just wish God would speak to me. And I'm telling you, let me, let me just speak on behalf of the Lord for you. You're doing all right. Stay on the path. Just keep being faithful of what you're doing. Let's not grow weary in doing good for the right time. We'll, re we'll reap a harvest if we don't give up. So stay on path knowing that God is guiding you, man. He loves you. He's speaking to you. And you may not have the full picture right now. I guarantee you, if you have the whole picture, you're probably on somebody else's path you're trying to be something you're not. I don't know where God's going to take you, but I can guarantee you this. It's going to be exceedingly abundantly far above all you could ever ask or think when God's Spirit is at work within you. The path of the righteous is like the light of dawn. It shines brighter and brighter. And you may be at your darkest moment right now. You may be like, it's the end. There's just no way I can recover from this. Well, that's your emotions. And they're lying to you. You will recover from this because the same spirit that raised Christ Jesus from the dead is living in you and he will give life to your mortal body. So don't you forget it. Sometimes you need to preach to yourself. You need to tell your body, your emotions, ah, ah, yeah, 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 yeah. love your emotions, but not listening to you right now. Because you're off. You're tired. You're worn out from all of the stuff we've been going through you're tired from the heat whatever it is when we walk in that truth you can be guaranteed the spirit is going to guide you you will hear the voice of the lord and i think this is the most important task for every christian is just learning to trust that the holy spirit is speaking to you and guiding you and whenever he asks you to do something do it as fast as you can immediate obedience and when he's not speaking to you trust that that means you're probably on the right path so stay the course and stay faithful to what god's called you to do you guys receive that let me pray for you. God, I thank you so much for your... Man, you didn't just leave us here alone. You left us the Holy Spirit to guide us. Your Spirit to guide us in truth. So I thank you, Lord, that we can be confident when we don't know what to do, when we're at the crossroads, when we're trying to make those decisions. Every step of the way, we have your Spirit guiding us in all truth. So I pray we begin to just surrender to that voice, listen to that voice. And if you're here this morning, you have not, first of all, surrendered your life to Jesus... To get access to the Holy Spirit, you need to surrender your life to Jesus. That You need that spirit of Jesus to come in and bring your dead spirit to life. So I'm going to say a prayer in just a second. If you say this prayer and you mean it in your heart, God is going to transfer you from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. He's going to set you up an eternal address in heaven. It starts by saying this prayer. Let's all say it together. Lord Jesus, we repent of our sin. We turn from our way. We turn to your way. Help us walk in your truth. Amen. Hey, if you just said that prayer, welcome to the kingdom of God. We'd love to give you some resources. In the back, just let us know you made that commitment this morning. Man, I pray you guys would walk with confidence in whatever your relational struggles, the financial struggles, the work struggles this week. God is guiding you. He's speaking to you. Listen to his voice. You can walk out of here with your head held high and your shoulders back, knowing the spirit of God is leading you and guiding you in every step. Be blessed. Y'all have a great week. If you are ever in the Seguin area, 
come visit us on Sunday mornings at 9 or 11 a.m. Or you can just download our app and receive our weekly messages right to your phone. Just text CC Seguin to 77977 and click on the link that you receive. May the remainder of your week be enriched with God's favor and blessings. <laughs>